Welcome everyone to our uh, worship service here this morning. I am Pastor Daniel, pastor here at the McCordsville United Methodist Church. And again, want to welcome you all that are joining us online uh, for, days, uh, for today's uh, time of worship. This is the Sunday that we do begin our Advent series or, and uh, begin our journey through Advent as following Christ through our lives. And so we look forward to today. We look forward to worshiping together. We look forward to encountering the Lord together. And our hope is that after this live stream, you'll feel uplifted and know without a shadow of a doubt that God is with you in this time. Amen? Amen. Well, I do want to share some strategic concerns with you. Uh, just a few of them here. Uh, Thanksgiving blessings. Yes, we as a church were able to help 30 families this year with uh, uh, their Thanksgiving meal. And so that is definitely something to celebrate. And again, we want to thank you all for your generosity on that. Also, another update again on the blood drives that we have been holding once a month since March. Uh, we as a church have collected 258 units of blood, which has the potential of saving the upwards of 700 lives. So that is just incredible. Uh, the people that, uh, that run the, the uh, blood drive have, have told us that we as a congregation have literally collected more units of blood than any other church in the, in the surrounding area. And so again, as just a, an awesome testimony to your guys' and to your heart of reaching out and wanting to help other folks. Toys for Tots, we will be collecting that for another couple weeks. Next Sunday, if you would like to drop off those uh, toys for, for kids, for Tots, uh, we will have someone here at the church for an hour following our live stream. So if you would like to, to drop those off, we will have someone here um, after church. But you may also uh, drop those off on Thursdays from 9 to noon and Wednesdays from 9 to 10. Uh, we will also, on top of this, we will be helping families with Christmas as well and sponsoring some families. So if that is something that you would be interested in, we do ask you reach out to us. You can send us a Facebook message. You can email us. Just let us know that you would be interested and sponsoring a family, helping a family with, uh, with ki uh, toys for their kids for Christmas. So please, please let us know that. Also, one other bit of news, I do want to remind everyone that this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we will be restarting our Wednesdays at 7. Uh, Corey and I will be uh, leading that. We will have uh, some music, we'll have a time of prayer together, but we will be discussing Hidden Christmas by Timothy Keller. It's not a long read, there's eight chapters in the book, and we'll be going over two chapters per week. Uh, but we do uh, ask that you uh, uh, plan on joining us. If you do have a book, great. You can still join us online. If you don't, uh, there'll be lots of great discussion around uh, Advent and around Christmas. Uh, so if you would like a book and would like us to order it, we're more than uh, willing to do that for you as well. Again, that'll be Wednesdays at 7. Now, I do have another update I want to share with you. Some, uh, some, uh, took some pictures of our food pantry. We talk a lot about this, uh, but, uh, but I would like to show you some of these uh, pictures. I mean, we are literally stocked and ready for, uh, for families. Um, and uh, I, there's four pictures, I believe, that I, or four slides that I believe I, I've shared. We have everything from, from toilet paper to Kleenexes to paper towels to cereal to... You know, who doesn't need Roman noodles, right? So, I mean, we have all kinds of food for our families. And I just wanted to give you guys a shot at what is, is happening behind the scenes uh, here with your congregation. Uh, so, uh, so, again, we want to thank you all for your generosity, for making that happen, for filling those shelves and ensuring that the hungry are fed. First candle of the Advent wreath. This is the candle of hope. With Christians around the world, we use this light to help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 9-2, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we look to the birth of Jesus, grant that the light of your love for us will help us to become lights in the lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming. For Jesus is our hope. Amen. Let's continue this time of worship together by declaring our faith together. Please join me now in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may have noticed just a bit of a change in the flow of the Apostles' Creed here this morning, and I know that my daughter Emily is watching, and Emily, the slower Apostles' Creed was for you this morning. 
Yes, yes, I joke, but she did get after me last week when I came home from worship. And she said, Daddy, you need to slow down on that Apostles' Creed. So I'm sure the rest of everyone can join her in thanking her for having me hit the brakes a bit. Well, this morning, do we have any other prayer concerns that we would, or prayer concerns that we would like to share with one another? I know we do have some. Sandy Kessler is in need of prayer uh, for her daughter, for her granddaughter's stepdad, and also for herself. So we do ask that you join us in praying for Sandy Kessler and the concerns that are shared there. We do want to continue to remember Steve McGoy and Edie McGoy. Steve uh, did, uh, was able to come home, and that is just an incredible blessing, and praise God for it. I mean, we as a congregation, one week we had uh, received the grim news that we weren't sure what was going to happen. And uh, within a week, things had turned around, and praise God for it. But continued prayers for the McGoys, and, uh, and also Edie has asked for prayers for her sister, I believe, uh, had broke her leg, so we do. I want to lift up um, Edie's sister in prayer. We also want to continue to remember the Bevington family and just ask that God would be with them. Uh, Brian Bevington especially, uh, he's needing some prayer. Are there any other prayer concerns that, uh, that we have? Any we've seen online? I don't believe so. No others? No others? So we will go and continue in this time of worship and I ask that you join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning just so grateful for the work that you are doing presently within our hearts, within our minds, within our lives, within our communities, within our communities, within our nation, within our country, God. And Father, what we ask is that you would help us to have eyes wide open to see where it is, God, that you are at work. These times can be heavy times for many. The holidays, they can be hard. And so, Father, we pray that during this time of Advent, that God, somehow, some way, you would reach in and just allow this time to be a time of preparation to celebrate you, Jesus. Father, for those that we have mentioned, we especially pray. We ask, God, that you would intervene in their lives, that you would bring healing to their lives, that, God, that you would just bring and, and pour out your grace into their lives. Father, for those people in our community that feel lost, feel confused, or just have, have gloom and fear that is just overcoming them, God, we pray for your light to shine bright within their hearts, within their lives. Father, for those people in our community that aren't in a relationship with your son, Father, we pray that you would guide us, lead us as your congregation to reach out to them, that through how we treat them, that through how we are in a relationship with them, that the love of your son would shine through and they would become open to entering into a relationship with him. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. quiet my soul lay your spirit speaks in my spirit I hear the sound of salvation song Jesus Jesus 
Thank you. 
Thank you for that song, guys. Beautiful song and uh, just such a such an on point song for I think all of us in this time. And uh, just uh, reminded me of how important it is for us to not lose sight of Christ, to not lose sight of Jesus, uh, but to always have Him uh, just right in right in our line of sight, right in our line of sight. This morning, uh, the message uh, title for today is a little a little illumination required. And uh, we'll eventually be looking at Isaiah chapter 9. Again, you heard a bit of the uh, passage of scripture already from the Advent reading. But we will be looking at Isaiah chapter 9. So that is where we're heading. So if you want to kind of get your place marked in your Bibles there, it'll also be uh, um, also on the screen here through the live stream as well. But if you'd like to make notes, I would get that ready. Well, I believe it was a week ago, Saturday, that the power in the Peyton house went out. Not too far up the road, I believe it was off of 75th Street, a uh, car took on a telephone pole and the pole won. When the car ran into said telephone pole, well, that caused a good deal of us in the McCordsville area to be without power. You would have thought... When that moment, when the lights went out, you would have thought that the world was coming to an end for my kids. No power meant no Netflix, no YouTube, no video games. Uh, what, what was Emily going to do if she could not charge her phone? Sarah, in the initial 10 minutes of Parsonage Darkness, uh, she took it upon herself to tell the kids that this was how families used to live. The kids' eyes got about as big as golf balls, wondering how on earth people survived. They weren't thinking about heat. They weren't thinking about ovens. They weren't thinking about lights. They were, again, thinking about not being able to use their gadgets or watch the TV. What I was most concerned about will probably not surprise you. The lights went out. I was concerned as to how we were going to eat the steaks that I had just taken off of my pellet smoker of a grill. I thought the timing was spot on. That pellet smoker requires electricity and the good Lord saw to it that I'd gotten our steaks done just for the evening, just before the lights went out. In order to eat, I'll take a guess at what we did. We broke out the candles. We broke out the oil lamp, and we had ourselves a fantastic candlelit steak dinner. <laughs> oh, sometimes you got to improvise. <laughs> but isn't that what we as people do? When we as people are presented with some darkness, expel it with some light. I wasn't going to have our dinner ruined because someone tried to take on a telephone pole. Oh, instead of scrapping dinner, because we couldn't see two feet in front of us, we beat that darkness with a little light. And it made, made for a fun evening. But again, isn't that what we as people do when presented with darkness? Ever gone spelunking before? It's a fun word. I always try to figure out ways to use it. <laughs> I would definitely not advise going caving without some supplemental light. Would you? Or say when we're out driving at night, what is it we do? Immediately we flip on the headlights and expel the darkness in front of us that we may navigate the night with ease. Or say you walk into a room in your home and it happens to be pitch dark, pitch dark. What is it you do but flip a switch to bring some much needed illumination to your room? Or... How about if you've ever tried looking for that lost remote under the couch? What is it we do? Grab our phones, hit the flashlight toggle, and beam some much-needed light under the darkness in the under the couch. 
only to typically find much more down there than just the lost remote. <laughs> this whole shining some needed light when presented with darkness, well, we aren't alone in doing so. We aren't the only ones when darkness is prevailing that we shine a little much needed illumination on things. For as we shall see in the scriptures today, this is very much a part of how God is at work within our world. See, we as Christians, we do not believe that God created all that is and then went on some kind of extended holiday. No, we as Christians believe that God is presently at work within our world. One way of many is how he is presently pouring out his grace upon us and upon the rest of creation to what to expel any encroaching darkness. His light, when shown upon us through us following his Son, he expels the darkness from the path of head and by his grace shows us the way in which we should live. Which brings us to a rather popular Christmas Advent-oriented passage of Scripture. Please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, and then verses 6 through 7. Isaiah writing, talking. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you in this time, continued time of preaching and teaching and pray for some much needed illumination within our hearts, within our minds, and within our lives. We pray this to be a time where we are molded and shaped into the people that you, by your Holy Spirit, are presently calling us to be. And all God's people said, Amen. May be seated, may be seated. When Isaiah said, the people who walked in darkness... Well, he wasn't referring to walking in literal darkness as when the power went out at the parsonage. The darkness he is referring to here was actually a darkness as a form of immorality, a form of evil, a form of, of sin spreading amongst the people. They, through a long list of corrupt kings, had fallen head over heels into the temptation that plagued them of wanting to not be God's peculiar people, but to be a people that looked light, lived light, that were like the nations around them. Call it peer pressure, I call it a strategic attack from the enemy. And the people of Judah, through decisions they made, were walking not in the light of God's truth, with sure and steady steps, but we're walking in darkness, stumbling about trying to find their way in the world. How dark had things become for God's people? Well, we don't have to go too far back initially to get a pulse as to how dark things had become. We only have to go back to Isaiah chapter 8. To see how far, as the Lord's chosen, that they had drifted from his path of certainty and of light. This is Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 19 through 20. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, Should not the people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, Isaiah says, they have no light of dawn. God's people have become so depraved of truth 
that they were churning not to the priests, not to the prophets, not to God, but to mediums and spiritists. One translation goes so far to say that the people were readily churning to necromancers to guide them. I mean, we're talking dark art stuff here. Witchcraft, Ouija boards instead of Bibles, sort of dark stuff. Instead of turning to the God of light, they turn to the ruler of this age, to the prince of darkness to find their way. And where do you think he led them? Down even darker paths, down even more God-forsaken paths than they were before. Isaiah continues talking of the results of the pursuit of darkness instead of light. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 21 through 22. Results. It says, distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and see only darkness and see only fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. Sounds like a uh, terrifying path to attempt to live one's life by. Where all you see is darkness. That all you see is fearful gloom. No hope. No, the sun will come out tomorrow. <laughs> sort of outlook. When our lives become devoid of God, though, this is, this is what happens. We turn to other things, worldly things, to guide us. God is the light of the world. And as light expels darkness, so he, when he is the center of our lives, expels the darkness that this world attempts to cloak our lives with. But when we snub him out, though, we embrace not the light, but we embrace the dark. Without God illuminating our lives, we're attempting to live life. Like attempting to eat a steak dinner in the dark. Can't even see the meat in front of us or the A1 to dip said steak in. Without God consistently shining his light in and through our lives to illuminate the path before us. We're attempting to live life as if blindfolded. Wondering why we keep getting hurt. Wondering why we keep following. Wondering why we keep stubbing our toes in life. It's because we've turned off the light. And are attempting to live as if the lights were on. So how did Israel get to this point? I mean, they're the apple of God's eye. I mean, they were his chosen people. But how did they get to the point that they did? Well, it did not happen overnight. Israel was sent down a slippery slope of sorts about 200-ish, 100 years prior. When a king named Solomon was in power. This was mid-900s B.C.-ish. Uh, ish. Again, ish. Now Solomon as a king was a bit of a mixed bag. Incredibly wise, yes. Solomon was the administrative mind that was responsible for political consolidation within Israel. This could be seen in his creating of administrative districts of the old tribalism of the Israelites. He even expanded the priestly duties of the king. But where he shined the most in his ruling was in his international trade that I would call his greatest strength, but yet also greatest weakness. Harper Collins Bible Dictionary talks of all this and saying, his empire included trade routes linking Africa, Asia, Arabia, and Asia Minor. Thus generating substantial revenue while supporting widespread commercial activities. Including, apparently, participation in the horse trade based in Asia Minor. His fleet sailed from Izan Gabit in the Gulf of Aquaba to Afor on the coast of the Red Sea. The wealth that Israel raked in during Solomon's reign was like none other. The people under Solomon's leadership grew more prosperous than they had ever been or ever would be as a people. It was even believed that the fulfillment of the Abraham promise, the patriarchal promise of living in a land that flowed with milk and honey, that it was fulfilled during Solomon's reign. The people 
prospered. Their cupboards were full. The expanse of the kingdom was something to behold. And Solomon put a cherry on the top of his reign when he built the temple of temples unto God for the Jews. That's where the good news ends. During such high times, the people, Solomon included, allowed their prosperity, allowed their success to crowd out God. And in so doing, allowed a bit of a shadow to be cast across the nation. They, they did not heed Moses' words upon their mountaintop experience. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 through 14. It says, take care, lest you forget the Lord your God, but by not keeping His commandments. And his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, said Moses. It says, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and you live in them. And when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied, that all you have is multiplied. Then your heart be lifted up and you forget. You forget the Lord, your God. That shadow that was cast opened the door for Solomon and the rest of Israel to delve into something called Canaanite worship, specifically Baalism. Shrines and altars were erected and high places were erected and the pure worship of God became polluted. Add to this a year-by-year -year raising of taxes the forcing of some Israelites into non-paid work. And I'm sure you could imagine the societal decay that plagued Israel. This decay led to schism that turned into a full-on split that ran through the nation of God. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took office. Didn't have the persona, had the charisma or the wisdom of his father. And the people as a whole refused to follow him. The actual conflict was around, again, the raising of taxes. All that expansion and all those buildings and all those amazing things cost. And the taxes kept going up. And when he refused to lower them, the split of Israel occurred. Israel then became the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. And then there was Judah and the tribe of Benjamin that became the kingdom of Judah. And it was to the people of Judah that the prophet Isaiah was addressing in Isaiah chapters 8 and 9, some 200-ish years later. Judah had their own mixed bag of kings and leaders to lead them. Many of whom were incredibly corrupt and bent towards the worship of, you guessed it, Baal. Fast forward again about 200 years and this is the context around these all familiar Isaiah 9 words were spoken. A king absolutely corrupt was in power during Isaiah 8 and 9. This king's name was Ahaz. Ahaz was believed to have been so morally depraved, so corrupt that he even delved into human sacrifice unto Baal. This included one of his sons. If this weren't enough, there was a growing threat of the Assyrian Empire. The surrounding king and the king of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of Israel, sought out Ahaz to join them in an alliance against Assyria. But Ahaz, he refused. He even ignored a word of prophecy that had come from Isaiah of how he and Judah would be able to beat the Assyrians and instead of aligning his will with God's, he aligned his will with the Assyrians and through some shifty deals, aligned the kingdom of Judah with Assyria and they became their puppets. And it was in this national and societal and personal darkness 
that people turn to mediums, witchcraft, necromancy, instead of God for direction. Nations split in two, worship of God on the way out, Baalism running rabid through the land. The people were lost. They were, as Isaiah 9 said, they were living, they were walking in a time of deep, deep darkness. But God, being the expeller of darkness that he is, he did not leave them in the cold. He shone upon them a great light and once again expelled the darkness that had encroached upon his children. Isaiah 9, 2, yet again. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of darkness, on them has light shone. God put his foot down on the darkness in a Clark W. Griswold-like way. War torn as a nation, literally ripped apart, kings aligning with pagan kings, skyrocketing taxes, forced labor. God, in the midst of their incredibly dark days, left them not to their own devices, but rather sent a word, a promise through Isaiah that shone ever so bright. A word of hope, a word of comfort, a word of certainty, a word that even drove out fear. This word, though, wasn't just words, just talk, as they say. This word pointed to a coming reality that the people of Judah desperately needed. A king was coming that would actually lead them, actually lead them in the ways and the path of God. For to us, a child is born. Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. A king would be born that would realign Judah to the intentions of God. This person, this king, had a name. And this prophecy, this cyclical, came back around in the time of Jesus. But here's what it meant originally. This king that was coming, his name was Hezekiah. And his son, the son, one of these sons of the immorally depraved Ahaz. How good of a king would it be? How would he actually lead? 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 3. Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. Hezekiah, by God's grace, expelled the darkness from the land. He removed the high places, he broke the pillars, he shattered the sources of darkness, and in their place, God's light was able to, to shine, shine upon his people again. No longer would they have to live in constant fearful gloom. No longer would they have to live in the dark as if the lights were on. They could see the steak dinner before them. They could again align their lives with God's. So what does all of this mean for us? And talking to friends and people in the church and just reflecting on this year. This year has in many ways, it's cast a, a shadow upon us. At every turn and every increase of COVID cases, it's as if life itself is attempting to chisel away at the hope we have within our hearts. A lesson we can learn today from the Israelites. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this once, darkness can not drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Don't turn to paths and ways that you know are God forsaken, that you know from your study of scripture and attending of church that you know are against our Father's ways. Rather, Turn again anew to God and faith, to the one who is the light of the world, the one whom can, by his very nature, by his very presence in your life, in my life, in our lives, expel the encroaching darkness. 
is turn again anew in faith to Jesus. Don't give in to the darkness. Don't give in to the fearful gloom. Don't give in to the, all the negativity that it seems to be spewing about. Instead of giving in to all of that, that it will only perpetuate your darkness, that it will only perpetuate the gloom that your life may, that you may be experiencing, but rather give in to Jesus, that his light may shine and expel that darkness from your life. You know, this makes me think of my wife, Sarah. Uh, a few weeks back, you know, we as a family, we were just struggling. Just struggling. Uncertainty of the holidays and the growing concern of COVID cases. Well, again, you know how 2020's been. And we were just in a funk. At first, we just sort of mulled around and wallowed in our pity. You know, wallowed in our woe is me. And wallowed in the negativity that life was feeding us. And guess what? It just got worse and worse. And then Sarah started decorating. Decorating for Christmas. She put a tree up, put a wreath up, garland. and I mean, it was just, it was just beautiful. Even turned on the TV to a YouTube channel that played Christmas music to a fireplace. <laughs> I kid you not, the simplest little change to not just give in to the moly grubs. To not just give in to that dark feeling and that darkness, but to add a little light and a little cheer to our house, it made all the difference. Walking to the home now feels a bit like walking into the Christmas store down in Pigeon Forge. It just puts a smile on my face. So in a similar way, don't give in to the debilitating, fearful gloom. That this world is attempting to feed you. Now rather give in to God. Give in to Jesus. And by faith. Decorate your life. With the ornaments. Of what we. As Christians. Believe. so good to be together with you here online on uh, Facebook Live, uh, uh, joined together in worship and in fellowship. And again, we hope that through today's service, you've been uplifted and that God's light had shone upon and in and through your life. Do want to again remind you that uh, this Wednesday, we'll begin the study around this book, Hidden Christmas. Uh, the Surprising Truth Behind the Birth of Christ by Timothy Keller. Now, as you can see, it's not a real long read, but there is some incredible truths uh, to be gleaned from this book. And we'll be discussing those together on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And again, I want to remind you about uh, the, the toy drop-off. If you would like to donate toys uh, next week, an hour following service time, which will be from 11 to noonish. Uh, we will have someone here at the church that could collect those toys. And we also will have someone here on Thursdays from 9 to noon and then Wednesdays from 9 to 10 uh, to collect those. Now, if, if those times don't work for you, don't worry. We could, uh, you just let me know, reach out to me directly uh, through a text, a phone call, and uh, uh, we can set up a time where you can deliver those toys here to the church. 
Uh, and again, we want to thank you ahead uh, already of your uh, generosity because we've uh, already been having families line up to sponsor families and, and to help out. And, and that is just an incredible, incredible expression of your faith. And, and thank you for it. So next week, I do have a bit of an interesting story to share with you. And it will, it involves a, uh, a, a missent or miss delivered box and some toys. So I hope that's piqued your curiosity and that will be a part of next week's service. And it's really a fascinating little tale of, of something that God has done uh, um, and through through my uh, our life as a church and, and, and my life and, and has just kind of blown my mind and, and, and my reaction to it has been and will be God really is with us. So next week you'll hear about that box and those toys. And, and I look forward to, uh, to joining you guys together again online. We ask that you share this video on your Facebook feed. Uh, send it out to friends. You can copy the link and emails and send it out. And again, we want this to be a blessing and want this to be a shining bright spot, a spot of hope within the lives of others. God bless you. And in the words of our good friend, Mr. Jim Turney... Go with God.